What is up, guys? I am Andres. This is RB3. I'm Sabrina. And I'm Mark. Can I introduce myself now? <laughs> yeah! <laughs> <laughs> we got Mark Ellis in the house, guys. Our, the guest that we've been trying forever to get on the show. RB3 and I were like, dude, what about Mark Ellis? Hey, have you thought of Mark Ellis being on the show? We should talk to Mark Ellis. Uh, and finally, due to quarantine events, due to these <laughs> circumstances, we can do a virtual version of Mark Ellis, which we will happily take. Uh, I can speak on behalf of everyone he here and say thank you, Mark, for being on the show. Mark Ellis in the house. Well, look, it's it's a thrill, but I know the reason that I'm here is only because not me, but my dog twice invaded y'all's show <laughs> in the last two months and demanded that you have her poppy on or else. That's right. Molly has been on the show, but not Mark. So finally, <laughs> Mark, the, the co-owner of Molly, has some say and ha gets to be on the show. Yeah, I'm, I'm like the 30% owner of Molly, but it is it is a thrill to be here. I'm 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 big fan of all three of y'all. Uh, Ace, you are the you're you're the most hydrated person I know. Um, Robert, you have the best laugh I've ever heard, and Sabrina, you are by far the best bruncher that I've ever seen. Like. Every day during quarantine, I'm seeing champagne and strawberries. And just please promise us you'll open a restaurant when this is all over. <laughs> yeah, I'm just trying to keep sane with all of this. But I will, once this is open, I'll have you guys. You guys yeah. can come over anytime. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, real quick, Mark, before we get into the topic today, uh, how's your quarantine going? You know, it's it's pretty much the same as my usual life. I've been practicing physical and social distancing for most of my time on Earth until you get to the nighttime and then nighttime is usually when I go out and do stand up. And so instead I just turn on we and play golf and it's, I, you know, it's, it's okay. There's, there's no drug on earth like stand up, And so I miss it dearly, but in the meantime, it has been fun getting to pop in and do more streams like doing y'all's. This is, this is, it's another way just to talk to people and entertain and discuss the, the silly stuff that we all love. So I'm, I'm just, I'm happy to be included. Yeah, again, thank you so much, RB3 and I. Again, as I said before, I've been trying to get you on for a while, and we're so happy to have you on because we get to have a guest of your caliber on the show. Now is the time where I see people trying to get like the crazy guests that they usually aren't able to get and are able to get now because they're not doing much of anything else. Uh, so I'm just like, yes, we got Mark. We did it. <laughs> we made it, guys. Well, my so. advice for y'all show would be to aim higher, but in, in, <laughs> I'll take it. This is the highest, man. I'm telling you, this is the highest. Uh, but again, uh, RB3, back. Uh, he mentioned to me that if we ever have Mark Ellis on the show, we have to talk back to the future. So I want to go straight to you, Mark. What is your relationship with Back to the Future? Well, I have my my Marty McFly pop toy right there, and I'm not I'm not a collector. I don't know the pop toys are going to be worth anything. So people yell at you for taking them out of the box. Like it's it's I want I want Marty to be free. Okay, so Marty's hanging out on my desk, and I've been a Back to the Future fan since basically as long as I can remember because the movie came out in 85 and I, I didn't, I, like I was way too young to go see it in the theater, but like Michael J. Fox was so big in the mid to late eighties. Cause he had back to the future and teen wolf and family ties. And like, that's the guy that I, I wanted to be like, I wanted to dress like him and, and act like him and be Marty McFly basically. And now when you go back and you watch particularly the first back to the future as an adult, you realize this is the most fun movie of all time. It's just the most enjoyable start to finish ride you can ever have. I mean, y'all know that I star Wars are my favorite series of movies of all time, but I think Back to the Future is just start to finish the most fun you can possibly have watching a movie. Absolutely. I want to go to Mark. I mean, I want to go to RB3 and Sabrina for the same question. What is your relationship with Back to the Future? I'll start with RB3. Uh, yeah, Back to the Future. I remember watching Back to the Future when I was first time when I was in like middle school or actually probably uh, late elementary school in like fifth grade. Um, and it was just because I was scrolling through TV and um, just randomly stumbled upon it. I think it was on Stars or Showtime, one of those one of those premium channels or whatever. And um, yeah, I remember watching uh, it for the first time and just like being mind blown. I mean, it was like one of those early movies you watch like as a young kid that just like really gets you into like what, you know, the magic of movies can be. And then uh, Back to the Future Part Two, like 
Uh, they have, you know, they will run, they always, and to this day, they still run them like all three back to back. Cause I feel like that's the way you kind of, you know, if you want to watch them all, it's, it's, it's best to watch them back to back. So I, I watched it, you know, them too, um, and had back to the future part two. And that one even like, as a kid, like back to the future part two is like the most amazing one, because for one, they go to the future for two, they go, uh, to an alternate 1985, which is like even crazier. Um, and you know, it's just awesome. And then back to the future part three is just an amazing, like watch the movie in and of itself mixed with the time travel aspect. So like, it was just really, really fun. And I, I remember when I was in, I think that, that, that same year, if not the year after for that Christmas, I asked for the Blu-ray, um, collector edition of the trilogy, uh, that, uh, of the back to the future trilogy. And since I had those Blu-rays, I mean, I like wore them out, like every, like I'll watch them so many times. Um, so yeah, I'm a huge fan of back to the future. Obviously. I just did the, the film Timestamp, and that was kind of like an, a lot of homage to Back to the Future. I love time travel based because of how much I love Back to the Future. There you go, Sabrina. Yeah, definitely. Um, I just I have such vivid memories of my dad showing me this movie for the first time, and I thought it was just such a beautiful. Well, for, look, the first time I was watching it, I was mind blown. But then later on, as you grow older and you you uh, rewatch it. It's just such a beautiful example of like perfect storytelling. I I hesitate to say that about a lot of things, but this really is, especially with, you know, the structure and everything, the way they handle it. It's so, so good. Such a good screenplay. I mean, they blew it out of the water. So I just think it's iconic. It's just it's yeah. very tough for me to hear that Robert was in fifth grade and had stars and showtime. <laughs> like when I was in fifth grade, you kids, when I was in fifth grade, we had to fiddle with the rabbit ears to make sure that we could get three. <laughs> <laughs> and you guys have your fancy cable when you're little kid. You this this whole generation. <laughs> spoiled. All of them are spoiled. Uh yeah, I mean, I feel like the relationship people have with Back to the Future kind of usually goes hand in hand with your family, right? It's interesting how most of us responded with some sort of family connection, whether it be you, Sabrina, with your dad and me personally with my dad, because I also had that same dad experience of sitting down and watching Back to the Future when I was old enough, I don't know, six or seven years old, I guess is old enough, uh, and watching that movie, even though the movie was notoriously neglected by Disney because it's like this weird incest mom and son thing that's going on so it's not quite the complete family movie uh that most people go to but at the same time our, our memories of this movie are kind of tied into our family can you speak to that mark yeah because my dad everybody in my family is is a great musician except for the guy talking right now like when we when we get together and do the Ellis family Thanksgiving hoot nanny everybody plays an instrument and I just MC the event and <laughs> I just introduced the band and then I'm off stage. So with Back to the Future, I remember my dad in particular lighting up whenever the Enchantment Under the Sea dance sequence takes place and Marty gets on stage and just rips into Johnny Be Good because my dad obviously grew up on Chuck Berry and he like he, he was a huge Beatles fan. And so Beatles were pretty much all we heard in the house. But when I heard him do that version of Johnny Be Good, I was like, what the hell is this? And so like the next two birthdays and Christmases and stuff are just filled with Chuck Berry records that I was getting. And I just, it was really, it's, it's a great movie and it's, and it's awesome to speak to that from a, from a cinephile point of view, but just as, as an exploration of the roots of rock and roll, it's just as important to me. Yeah. Did you, did you want to learn the guitar based off that? I did until I realized I have little tiny cocktail weenies on the end of my hand. <laughs> I have little tiny Trump hands and I can't really get the around the neck. And yeah. so I yeah. played drums for a little bit. Um, and I, I can play drums okay. Like I can play drums well enough to keep up with my brother, my sister, and everybody else. But my brother and my dad were the two uh, guitar shredders in the family. Yeah. Uh, Sabrina, do you have like a family memory with uh, Back to the Future at all? Uh, I just remember one Fourth of July, my dad um, was lighting off illegal fireworks, like ones that we would always get the cops called on our house for. Um, and yeah, they had Back to the Future playing in the living room for like all the kids and stuff like that. So we were just having a good time watching it. RB3. Yeah, I mean, I remember watching it with uh, like with my moms a lot too. Like we used to watch. Um, and yeah, it, it, to me, it's, it's funny because like she, my mom, you know, she's from like, like the, she grew up in like the seventies and eighties and all that, but she wasn't like as into it when it, when it first came out. But like, 
because of me and because of how much I watched it, we we ended up it kind of became like a like a family thing in and of itself. Um, and that's you know, and um, I think everybody. I mean, it's just like one of those like universal movies that like no matter like kind of like what background you're from or like whatever um, you you watched growing up or whatever you're into, it kind of appeals to like everything. Like it's funny and then it's like really you know kind of smart when you kind of think about it. Um, and then they, they, it's like, you know, like you said, it's not like exactly a family film because there are like more kind of risque elements to say the least, but like the, at, at the, at the heart of it, it is about like being with family and connecting with family and saving, saving somebody's family. Um, and yeah, so I, I really love it and really respect it for that. Yeah. I, I feel like back to the future has that connection, but it's interesting because Sabrina mentioned something in the beginning. She said, you, you think it's perfect storytelling. And it's interesting because the, the best thing I've heard of Back to the Future is the script. So I want to jump straight to the script. I believe it's Bob Gale and Zemeckis who wrote this movie uh, together. What is it about the script? And I'm going to go to the Mr. Director first for this question because you are the director between all four of us. Uh, what is it about the script that makes it so perfect that people consider it to be a perfect script? Yeah, I mean, that's what a lot of people, you know, that's kind of the general consensus that you see like online is that Back to the Future is like the perfect script. And like from a, for, I think for a lot of people on a structural level, it has like the perfect like three act structure, right? Like the beginning, you see like the family life and like how the 80s, in 1990, the 1985, like family is kind of like miserable and everybody like kind of hates each other in the household. Um, and you obviously have, you know, the older Biff who's like bullying the heck out of George McFly, like in the beginning. And it's like, dang, you feel so bad for this dude. You feel so bad for Marty. Like you can't, I can't imagine having the father's getting punked like that. You know what I mean? So then, um, so then it goes from like how awful that situation is. And then it goes to like the, to the actual time travel in and of itself. And then you get to reestablish like the younger version of the characters and see how they end up getting to that point. And then, so it's like perfect characterization, perfect structure. And I think the biggest part, which like definitely like cannot be ignored is like the tone, right? Like the tone is like absurd, it's funny. It's almost like winking at the camera to like a certain extent. And in doing that, it gives the movie uh, the best opportunities to like have a little more like ridiculous kind of premises. like. Can anybody really time travel if you put a DeLorean at 88 miles per hour? No, but the tone of the of the script makes it makes it that way. We don't know that. Have have you have you tried it? Because I've never tried. It. <laughs> I, I haven't tried. I haven't tried it. But you know, I, I I'll take your word for it, Mark. I don't know if you, if you experimented <laughs> like with if DeLorean. You've done it. Yeah. <laughs> when I was a kid, we uh, like down the street, th there were like rumors at first of, of this neighbor that had a DeLorean. And like, so we'd sneak around the house and like try to look in the garage. We didn't realize that this guy had like this shed in the back and that's where the DeLorean was. So one night we actually snuck like all the way around and we peeked out over the window and we saw the DeLorean under a tarp. And it was, it was like beholding this magical time machine that we had always heard about. And so we never actually made physical contact with the DeLorean, but I looked at it and Robert, I'm telling you, I think that thing can go back in time. <laughs> I mean, just based you know, on the design. <laughs> yeah, literally, I was gonna say like, there isn't a single car that probably is more fit to like, feel like a time travel car than a DeLorean. Like. Yeah, and I wanna go to you, Mark. Obviously, I'm getting back to the script. You, you were a writer beforehand, right? I believe so. I don't know how to write or read. A, um, that's, <laughs> that's some sort of bad information that you got. I mean, I, I write my own jokes and I'll write like an occasional article for a publication. But um, my my love of the script, because I've never actually attempted to write a script myself, and it's probably not going to happen unless this thing, this quarantine lasts like another 10 years, is I think that the script knows how good it's, it is. And I love when art gets to the point where it's so cocky and it's confident because you can tell it loves itself because it keeps quoting back the same lines because they're just that good. They're just that memorable. Like from Principal Strickland calling Marty's dad a slacker to what are you looking at butthead to if you put your mind to it, you can accomplish anything. It's just, it's such a quotable movie and how much fun it has with all those callbacks 
It's just, you know, and, and even there's just little things in the script that foreshadow what the movie's going to be. Like when at the beginning of the film of the first one, when Marty gets blown away by the amplifier and he just says, oh, rock and roll. It's like that. That's what you're in for. He's, Marty is preparing us for the ride we're about to go on. And the script is so tight. It doesn't waste words. It has so much fun and just celebratory juice inside of it that. It's just, it, even though I, I can't read legally, if I learned how to read, I would want to read this script. <laughs> <laughs> Sabrina. Yeah, no, I echo a lot of what you guys said um, about the script being so, so smart because it's incredibly self-aware, like Mark was just saying, um, but at the same time, it's not self-indulgent. So it's self-aware where we can really enjoy it and we could have a good time with it. Um, and it's aware of how smart it is. So I, I really applaud them for pulling all of that off because... This is a, that's an incredible feat with everything they have, with a little bit of incest, a little bit of little bit of time travel, all of that mixed in. The fact that they pulled it off the way they did. It's like it's it. like it's like the Powerpuff Girls: a little sugar, a little spice, a little <laughs> incest. Yeah, you get the you get the yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean the creation behind this movie and going back to the script, it's interesting because Zemeckis and Gale notoriously went around different studios trying to get this thing greenlit, uh, and it took Steven Spielberg essentially pitching this movie to Universal uh, to get them to approve the budget and to approve the creation of this film, which I find to be a fascinating story, story within itself because they needed Spielberg to kind of approve it. And it's like, dude, trust me, if Spielberg says yes, then you got to do it. Uh, that's one thing that I find interesting behind this creation of this movie. But another thing is that they cast a completely different Marty McFly. Uh, I believe his name is Eric Stoltz. Uh, and they actually shot quite a bit of footage with him. And then they eventually fired him, which I think is the most heartbreaking Hollywood story I've ever heard. Uh, what do you guys think about that? And have you heard that story before, Mark? I have, yeah. And and Eric Stoltz has gone on to to a fine career in, in acting. He's a respected thespian. He's, a, he's great in Pulp Fiction. But there's just something about Marty McFly the way that he's played by Michael J. Fox, it, you talk about the script, it just, it, there, there's good lines on the script, but he's, and I've said this before, I think he's the only person that could play Marty McFly. I think it's one of the hardest roles to nail. You can get a good young actor to pull off something like that but you can't do it to the level that Michael J. Fox brought to Marty McFly. And I think that that's a reflection of the whole movie because, I mean, let's be honest, if, if you put me in a time travel movie that's got some comedy in it some drama some i'm, I'm gonna enjoy it like, like back to the future would have been an enjoyable movie even if it wasn't great it would have been at least okay but to be a film that we celebrate all these many years and decades later you it, it has to be memorable and michael j fox is just so memorable in the role of marty mcfly that i applaud the filmmakers for looking at Eric Stoltz and being like, hey, it's it's not you, it's me. <laughs> it's like, like they had to use the classic breakup line because it's like, you're not doing anything wrong. It's just, you're not the one for me. So I need to move on. And hey, you better to do it three or four weeks into shooting or whatever they did than have the movie come out and just have it not be this thing that we are talking about. Yeah, and I believe this was Michael J. Fox's kind of, is, is it his first huge role? I, I think it is, right? It well, he, he was big on TV because he was a big star from Family Ties as Alex P. Keaton. And so right. his, his shooting schedule what was a nightmare because like you go back and watch Back to the Future, a fair amount of that movie takes place at night for a reason. It's because he was shooting Family Ties during the day and then he'd have to go maybe you get an hour nap and then go do scenes for Back to the Future. And so it was just a brutal schedule that that guy went through. But you look at what came out of it and... It's just this, it's this fascinating story. If you give me, if you indulge me for a minute, I'll tell you a great quick backstory. Oh, please back do. So Michael J. Fox had actually filmed Teen Wolf first before Back to the Future. And my buddy, Court McCown, who's a really funny comic and actor, he was also in Teen Wolf. If you go back and watch Teen Wolf, he's one of the other guys that's on uh, the, the Teen Wolf's basketball team. And so you like, and you see him on the court. And so him and Michael J. Fox were kind of buddies. So cut to, I don't know, six months, eight months after they were done shooting Teen Wolf, Court is walking down the street and Michael J. Fox is driving by in some sports car and he sees Court. And he's like, hey man, get in. I'm going to do ADR for this other movie that I just shot. And him and Court were talking and Court's like, yeah, when, when is Teen Wolf coming out? And Marty said, well, Marty, Michael J. Fox said, 
Well, look, I think that they're going to put it behind this other movie because the studio is really excited about this other movie that I'm working on that I'm going to do this voiceover for. And so Court watched Michael J. Fox go into an ADR studio and do voiceover for Marty McFly. And so he got to see some of the creation of Back to the Future. And it's just like that that fun little random Hollywood on a Tuesday afternoon story. But I just I get chills thinking about it because those are two movies that define my childhood. And to think of what a star Michael J. Fox was about to become at that time, it's it, it's pretty exciting. Yeah, he blew up after that movie and obviously after Teen Wolf as well. The guy was it's interesting because the guy is considered to be like the, the really fun, plucky kid in Back to the Future. But at the same time, he is actually really well respected within the acting community as actually being a genuinely good actor. Can you speak to me on that, RB3? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, he's had so much, like he, you know, Michael J. Fox has had like an incredible uh, reputation of like having, you know, uh, being like a hard worker, like 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 Mark had, 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 had spoke about the idea of like him doing both the, the television show and the movie at the same exact time. And, I, you know, there's a thing, you know, you read online, he was doing like, two or three hours of sleep a night, you know, just because he was double dipping and he was doing back to the future on the weekends, like for the day scenes and then everything like that. So it's like, it's incredibly hard work to do. And, but honestly, like, and like, like Mark said, I really can't imagine anyone else playing Marty McFly. Like it's kind of pitch perfect casting. It's like Robert Downey Jr.'s Iron Man. You know, it's like, you can't really, you can't really ask for a better casting. And it's, you know, it's props to, um, to Robert Zemeckis for, knowing uh that was going to work out and no, you know even though it's kind of it's sad to hear about the eric stose thing and how he was i, I think he shot for like four weeks or something like that I and think then it was six. or six weeks yeah and then um and then ended up you know leaving the project but like that just tells you that there's great fortitude and, and a great mind like 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 robert zemeckis to know like if the, the tone just wasn't working um the and you need somebody who's like who could toe that line between comedy and drama and have that like really good like sensibility to um, know what the, the movie's kind of going for in order to make it work. Yeah, I mean, Sabrina, obviously we're talking about the cast. Is there a specific cast member or character or actor or performance that really stands out to you? I'm still echoing Michael J. Fox just because yeah. um, how hard of a worker he is and the energy he brings into that film with the hours he was spending doing family ties. And this one, I, I was reading that he would, they'd be shooting till like three in the morning. He'd sleep a few hours, go back. And if they had to um, shoot during the day, he'd be doing it on the weekends. So for him to be working that hard and then to bring that energy, because he is the heart of the film. Barty McFly is this like Super, I remember seeing it and just being like, that guy is so cool. Like, I want to be friends with that guy. And um, yeah, so whenever they talk about Back to the Future reboots, remakes that they're doing, I'm just like, please don't. Like, I, I don't think anybody, just like, please don't. Like, let it let it rest. Um, this is perfect the way it is. I can't see anybody else, even a talented, talented um, younger actor. I just can't see them bringing the energy and heart that he does into the film. Yeah. And, yeah. and that I got, you know, and while we shout out Michael J. Fox, you also got to shout out Christopher Lloyd too. I was about to. Yeah. I mean, cause that, that, that's like the perfect companion piece too. It's like, it's like the perfect mixture of chaotic energies, like colliding into like the ultimate, you know, buddy, buddy kind of comedy sci-fi film. Yeah. I was about to say Christopher Lloyd, we cannot forget the greatness of Christopher Lloyd and his performance in this movie and the relationship he has with this high school teenager who likes to play rock and roll is like even more interesting. I find to be, I think it's hysterical. <laughs> uh, and obviously this has inspired, uh, obviously Rick and Morty, which is like one of the most popular shows on TV, or, or I don't know if it's still as popular as it is now, but it inspired that kind of style of like, Marty and Doc Ock kind of going on, not Doc, Doc Brown, I'm sorry, kind of going on their adventures and, tra and time traveling, which I find to be fascinating because this movie inspired so many generations to create their own content and their own style and their own versions of comedy fused with science fiction, which I think is a really cool combination. Uh, uh, as, what does this movie mean to you as far as inspiration goes, uh, Mark? 
it's it's just one of those ones that anytime you need a pick me up, you can put it on and you can find so many different storylines to get invested in because this movie would have been good if you were just following Marty McFly and everybody else was just kind of background. But there's there's this different character that you can pay attention to every time you watch this movie and find something new. Like how many movies can you say that you've seen a hundred times? But every time you watch it, something new pops out of you, a new line, a new a new look that somebody gives. I mean, you talk about how great Christopher Lloyd is in this movie. Leah Thompson is note perfect in both decades. And I mean, Crispin Glover is just unreal, funny and weird in just the right amount of, of dosage with George McFly and Thomas F. Wilson as the ultimate bully of the 50s slash 80s as Biff. It's just the list goes on and on as to how much fun you can have watching this movie. It, it can actually like make me feel better in my day, even just talking about it. Like I, I was feeling good when we went to air and now I feel like I'm, I'm in a better mood because of this. Yeah, I mean, obviously I can stay on this cast forever, but uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the iconic DeLorean. We have to talk a little bit about this car because I feel like this car means so much to me. I, I grew up with a family. My, my brother is a car head, like he loves cars. He's a mechanic, like he literally does this for a living. He does cars for a living. Uh, and, and I swear, like the biggest, most gangster car of all time, not a Lambo, not a Ferrari, uh, not any Fast and Furious car, but it is the DeLorean. I feel like it's it's ironic. And I'll go to you, RB3, because the, the fusion between Back to the Future and almost like hip hop culture a little bit, because I remember seeing the DeLorean in music videos and being like, yo, if I get a DeLorean, I'm good. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like I could be this looking, I could look anywhere, but if I have that car, I'm good because it has this weird, same with the kicks in Back to the Future 2 mm -hmm. that has like a hip hop connection. Mm -hmm. But but the iconic nature of the DeLorean, uh, what does that mean to you, RB3? Yeah, and I, uh, you know, like you said, I mean, because I think, you know, if I'm not mistaken, when the DeLorean came out like in the 80s, it was like one of those more pricier, uh, kind of more expensive cars. So it always had like that kind of wealth symbol behind it. But then Back to the Future took that and flipped it into like a, it made it more of a mainstream kind of appeal kind of thing, you know, and um, and kind of all, like maximize the brand to, to a different level. Um, and my personal connection, I totally forgot to mention this when we're talking about like childhood connections. Right. But like I used to when I was a kid, I used to go to like Universal Studios, like super often, like because that was the one amusement park that like my mom liked to go to because it didn't have like rides and, you know, she didn't like like roller coasters and she didn't like Disneyland because like it's too expensive. So like Universal is always like the perfect middle ground. And I remember that Back to the Future ride. I must have written that ride like at least 40 or 50 times like as a kid. And like, I remember they used to have like that, that chicken spot, Doc Brown chicken, uh, you know, where they, where they had like the, like the fried chicken joint over there. So it was like all, all of that. It was like, it was like the whole experience, the whole package. Um, but I remember the Back to the Future ride that would literally pack you into like a mini like replicant like uh, DeLorean with a bunch of other people and you would go on like, you know, they have the giant screen and you would go on like this like ride slash adventure like through the movie and like with the characters and all that. So like as a kid, like that was kind of also another way of me acclimating to like the Back to the Future mythology just through like proximity of like that ride and then feeling like you're like firsthand and like this luxury car kind of experience doing all these sort of time travel adventures. Yeah, and Mark, obviously you told us earlier that you got to visually witness the Holy Grail mm -hmm. itself, the DeLorean, in person. <laughs> How was that? It, it was only the Holy Grail of cars after Back to the Future came out because the DeLorean itself was this mid-80s car that was released and, and was a flop. I mean, the car came out to a lot of fanfare like it was going to be a rival to Lamborghini or Ferrari and and it just bombed nobody nobody wanted one but they're making back to the future and, and so doc says you know if i figure go back in time when i go back with some style it's like that line might not have even worked by 1987 but the fact that Back to the Future was so good kind of put DeLorean back on the map and i'm so glad robert brought up the universal ride because i forgot about that i went to the one one time i went to universal studios in florida um, and and we did the Back to the Future ride, and I do remember eating delicious chicken right afterwards. I'm not sure if they have a Doc Brown's in the Florida one too, but that's probably where we went. Now that I'm like piecing together the visuals and the smells of my youth, I'm, I think that it was a Doc Brown's chicken after all. 
<laughs> that sounds incredible. Uh, Sabrina, does this car mean anything to you at all? Uh, yeah, guys, I know nothing about cars, but it <laughs> looks sick in, sick in the movie, right? So it's I cool. Mean, yeah. It's the goal. It's the goal. I think it's called gold wing doors. Yeah. Those things are so cool. I swear. I like, I, I think I might be the only one, but I swear. Like, I think that's the most gangster car ever. I think like if I was in a hip hop music video, put me in a DeLorean, put me with like crazy neon lights and I'm good. I feel like I could do anything with that car. Well, and uh, now, now you see people who are like doing like, or instead of like getting uh, Lamborghini or not like Lamborghinis, but like limousines for like prom or whatever, they're pulling up in DeLoreans. You know, I've seen people come to movie premieres in DeLoreans. Like, it's just crazy how much like even to the to this day, Back to the Future made DeLoreans like a revelant thing. Uh, you know, even to this day. Yo, my yeah. car is called a Ford Fusion. Okay, there's only one reason why it's called a Ford Fusion, and I guarantee you, it's because of Mister Fusion, which is what you use to fuel the Back to the Future car in the movie. Ah. I am not, you're not convince me that there's any <laughs> other reason that my car is called a Ford Fusion other than Back to the Future. Wow, that's good. I mean, you might be right. I mean, considering how much this movie inspired, it inspired obviously the notoriously. Uh, non hoverboard hoverboards that came out a few years ago uh that people yeah. were kind of obsessed with uh it inspired actual technology with the trains too i think a lot of people have given it credit with those crazy bullet trains that are actually in use uh that people are you know actually using today uh which i think is incredible but the reception of this movie and the conversation this movie created there's that famous scene that i thought was amazing in stranger things uh season 3 where the audience first watches Back to the Future and then the reaction is just pure like elation and joy. They're like, ah, what did we just watch? Uh, and it's an incredible moment because that's kind of the reception it got. This was on the level of almost the Star Wars-like reception where it immediately became iconic. Uh, talk to me about that, Sabrina, just how much this movie means to so many people. Yeah, it's still, after all these decades, like it's still so relevant into pop culture. Like even my favorite comedian is John Mulaney and he has a whole bit about Back to the Future and it is hilarious. I, I love all that kind of stuff. And um, I think I think something like this was so groundbreaking and revolutionary and that even from years to come with younger filmmakers like RB3, like what he just said with Timestamp, um, it's, it's gonna continue to like, inspire people to create something of their own like this kind of story like something iconic like star wars or back to the future i think these these are both like created their own lanes that other people kind of gather a little bit of inspiration from so i really really um i love that it's still so heavily celebrated to this day yeah and the fact that it's a time travel movie and we've had so many time travel movies now that are they're almost kind of a joke considering hot tub time machine uh, my, my first thought goes to Avengers Endgame when when uh, Adam Lang, uh, Ant-Man, has that famous line of, you're telling me Back to the Future is a bunch of bullshit. Mm -hmm. uh, that's an actual <laughs> famous line in, a, in the biggest movie of all time, Avengers Endgame. Uh, but just the fact that when people think time travel, they think Back to the Future, Mark. I mean, that's incredible. I mean, look, Back to the Future, the one thing I'll say about that, that could be a detriment is that it might have set uh, time travel science back 50 years because <laughs> everybody who's at the forefront of that industry is trying to figure out how plutonium works with the flux <laughs> capacitor. And it's like, no, you got to get out of your back to the future headspace if you <laughs> want to go back in time. So I don't know which movie version of time travel is the most accurate. I don't know if it's uh, if it's that or Hot Tub Time Machine or Bill and Ted or The Time Machine or any of these other films, but it's just, it's the most fun you can have with it. And 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 if you talk about reception, like I'm actually curious because y'all are a little younger than me. So you, you don't have the emotional calluses that life will put on you like I have. Can you think of a movie that you've seen, I don't know, in the last decade, 20 years, post 2000, that has like filled you with that just sense of, optimism and and joy and youthful energy that back to the future does i i really i really don't know i mean it's probably a different different sense than what i've gotten from back to the future as a kid i mean for me i always go back to like the first avengers movie um that movie gave me a lot of you know that, that movie just had me hyped up i told that story on, on the podcast before that was my favorite movie going experiences of all time so probably for me like that one 
but it's a it's a different kind. That's more of like a fanboy, more of like you know it built up to this series and, and had that moment. But for in terms of like a first time movie, I don't I don't know. I don't, I think Back to the Future is like really a once in a generational type of thing. But but kind of going off that, the fact that that the the MCU kind of takes the same Back to the Future formula of having the combination of the tone, the comedy, the action scenes, the the quippy lines, like that's kind of what the MCU is. And if I have to answer your question, Mark, I would say something like a Guardians of the Galaxy for me, which is another MCU film, or maybe a Thor Ragnarok, which I walked out of that movie and I was like, that was so much fun. I think that's probably the same level. Sabrina? Yeah, besides MCU, I can't really think of too much. Um, I would really love if like an original idea, original property came out and kind of gave off that exact like reception. Um, so ho hopefully looking forward to that coming out but, in the future. Maybe RB3 will be the one. I mean, maybe a timestamp is not nearly Back to the Future. <laughs> uh, I was um, going to say the next Back to the Future timestamp is coming out. Nah, eventually. nah. <laughs> it's, de it's definitely not that. But I, uh, but I think I think I don't even think it's possible to really make that kind of movie that kind of has that like original kind of movie that has that kind of pop like in today's era. I think that's almost impossible. I mean, maybe, you know, I mean, we're, you know, Ace's favorite uh, movie uh, franchise of all time, The Matrix, might be pretty much the only other example of like an original, like first movie that had like a universally, like widely acclaimed um, reception like that. But beyond that, I'm not really sure. And I don't know if it's, even possible, I think, you know, I don't want to say like Back to the Future is like a lightning lightning in a bottle, but it kind of almost is. I mean, it, it, it has like this uh, multi-generational following that like that continues uh, to persist like even to this day. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's absolutely incredible what it's done. And before we go to break, I, I want to give you guys an opportunity to tell me either your favorite scene, favorite line in the movie, favorite running joke. Anything like that. And obviously, I'm going to go to you first, Mark. <laughs> All right. There's name a few. There's so many obvious ones. Like the most obvious one, if you've ever spent two minutes with me, you know, the obvious one is it, it checks off two of my boxes in one scene, which is where Marty dresses up as an alien from space and breaks into George's house and he puts the headphones on him. And to wake him up with this ultra futuristic alien sound he plays eddie van halen playing guitar and so and then that's one and then when he says that his name is darth vader it's like we have van halen and star wars within the same breath this is the greatest thing ever that's but pretty great there's there's another like thomas f wilson is just so good in this but i'm going to save my favorite thomas f wilson moment for the other side of the break so just in the first movie, there's a quick look. So next time you watch Back to the Future, look for this, is when they go into the cafe to bully George. And this is right when Marty's gotten back to 1955. I know and exactly what you're talking about. They start. They all start picking, Biff and his gang start picking on George, making fun of him and telling him to do his homework. And then Biff turns his attention to Marty and he's like, what are you looking at, butthead? And he goes over and then they start messing with him. And George gets this look on his face like, like, <laughs> no. like now he's one of the gang that's making yeah. he got bullied all his life now he gets to be part of the gang for that one second and it's just it's one of the funniest looks go look for it next time you watch it i, I definitely will uh rb3 and sabrina do you have anyone or anything do you want to go okay. yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I think the opening scene is really iconic and it sets up the tone. It sets up the entire story. It gives you so many little details that you don't realize that you're picking up on until like afterwards when it all comes back. Um, so I, I still love that opening sequence. I think it's flawless. RB3. Yeah. No, 100%. I like the root, like the Rue Goldberg machine, like how it like puts everything together and just to feed a dog. Like it's literally an entire lab mm -hmm. set up to like automatically feed a dog is hilarious. <laughs> I just think that's so funny. Um, I, to me, my, probably my favorite overall, I guess maybe not scene, but like sequence is the clock tower sequence at the end, like that race to, uh, to, to try and get the, uh, you know, the lightning is about to strike at the certain time, but then trying to get the, uh, the DeLorean to hit 88, I like the perfect timing and it just works out like just right, just perfectly. Um, I think even Cinefix has like, they used to do the series called like Art of a Scene. And they did a whole video talking about breaking down that one particular scene and everything that leads up to it and how that, you know, how everything in the movie leading up to that point pretty much all culminates into this one scene. And it's just, it's really cool and brilliant. And then 
I, I want to shout out one more one more thing too uh, that we didn't touch on is the uh, is the uh, Mayor Godi uh, kind of storyline. That's like a very subtle storyline, but it's actually like kind of impactful. Like when you really think about it, like the idea of like this black dude who was just like a waiter in the in, in the cafe back in like 1955 and ends up becoming the the mayor like 30 years later and he even has that line of like um he's like one day i'm gonna be mayor da, 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 da. and then and then the the guy behind the counter is like yeah 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 and the guy behind the counter is like a colored mayor what are you crazy like, <laughs> you're just like, hey, like 1955 was wilding back then man. <laughs> but, uh, it was. yeah 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 so i mean but then but it just goes to show i mean it literally shows you how much time has changed like even in the span of like 30 years and how and how impactful that stuff is uh, yeah, even, say, even, oh go ahead sabrina well, even the world building with like the entire 1950s you get a complete sense of what it is it's almost like nostalgic capturing it so when you first start out um like going in back into the 50s it has that music playing everybody looks so happy and then you're right back in it and you see moments like that and it kind of just like grounds all of that again yeah, and, and compared to the 1985 stuff which is like dirty and miserable like everybody looks mm -hmm. like they kind of hate each other um uh, another favorite scene of mine is just that whole dinner table scene like in the beginning where uh you get like the drunk uh well, marty's mom is like this drunk and the the brother is like coming out of prison and they, they made him like this miserable looking cake like it's just oh it's so funny and then they and then biff brings back the car like tore up like wh like what like i don't know this is really <laughs> funny it's just that's so my funny. most my most quoted it, probably at least on the weekends is anytime i have a beer at anybody's house i say <laughs> hey to have your car towed all the way to your house all you got for me is light beer <laughs> 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 and obviously uh, the whole Johnny B. Good scene, just like we, we did yeah. um, the, a collider a couple of years ago, did like a screening of Back to the Future at, at Arclight. And so watching it on a big screen and having that moment, knowing it's coming and, and like preparing for it and getting excited for it and still not realizing how impactful that scene was to my family, to me on my entire life, like the just the hair on your arm just stands up. It's just it's so, so good. One, one more moment. I'm sorry. One more moment. It's, it's, oh, you man. It's, 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 We're gonna go on for two hours. I'm sorry. I just I can't I can't not shut this moment out. When uh when uh they get into the uh when when uh maybe maybe this isn't even in part one. Maybe it's in part two. I'm not sure. But like when um when uh when when Marty or somebody's running, but then they they go into the car with all the the guys in the band, and then uh. And Biff is like chasing him, and and literally like they all get out of the car at the same yeah. time and just look at him. <laughs> just, yeah, 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 exactly. Ah, oh, dude, so good. Yeah, it's it's so many incredible moments, obviously, and and I actually think the the sequels have some pretty great moments as well. But obviously, those are our thoughts on the first film. Right after the break, we're gonna get into Back to the Future two and three. So make sure you guys stick around. This ain't funny, so don't you dare laugh. With the four fifth to buy you in half, you getting at me equals a club half. You do the math. Take you out the equation. The following is an excerpt from our spoiler analysis of the new FX show Devs, available exclusively on our YouTube channel, First Cut. Enjoy. I had in the finale, and immediately I was. Oh my God, I'm catching things now that I didn't catch before because they're literally telling me uh, about what Lily is. I mean, literally, she hands her hands like she's on a cross mm -hmm. representing the anomaly, the break in the matrix. And I immediately started to think like, wait a minute, is this show saying that Jesus was another anomaly? Like he was a break in the matrix in real life. And, and that's why they kept going back. And Lily wasn't the first, like Jesus was before that. And the fact that he made a choice and he had a predetermined prophetic vision of dying. And the fact that his death sparked the modern world we know today. The, I mean, you can't deny that. The fact that we, we live in a world of after Christ. Come along, children. Now we're going to have a little music. music, music. What is up, guys? We are back talking about Back to the Future. Now we're going to get to the sequels, Back to the Futures 2 and 3. And obviously, let's start with the, the better one, in my opinion, uh, Back to the Future 2, which I have to start out by saying this. It, 
I feel like there's a conversation around this movie, and correct me if I'm wrong, guys, but it's not quite as positive as the first one. And that's kind of disappointing to someone like me who really enjoys this movie. Is that the case, Mark? And why is that the case? Well, okay, are you saying, do you actually prefer two to the first one? Ooh, I mean, I, I think they're e- they're almost equal, man. I, I I love them both equally. Is that okay? <laughs> I would say no, no, Andres. It's not okay for you to like things that aren't the same things that I like in the same order yeah. that you like them. Um, I'm sorry. No, no. I, I I think it's it's a totally fair point to have, and I have friends that actually prefer two or three to the first one. But I I have the first one like as maybe my favorite non Star Wars movie ever, and then I have the the sequels somewhere further down the line considerably, although I still thoroughly enjoy those. Like one of the coolest things about, you know, being my age is that when you saw Back to the Future for the first time, I remember the DeLorean taking off and flying right at us. Then it says to be continued. And you're like, we get another one of these? What? When does that happen? And then to hear that Robert Zemeckis was actually going to shoot two and three back to back. That was like one of the first movie scoops I ever heard from my mom is that they're actually working on it because – I think that the way that they did it in the theater, because by by the time two came out, we had just moved. Um, my dad had gotten out of the Air Force, and so we just moved to Williamsburg, Virginia. And one of the first movies we saw uh, the town over, because we didn't have a movie theater, was uh, Back to the Future 2. And at the end of Back to the Future 2, they had a preview for Back to the Future 3. And so it was like, we just saw, saw more Back to the Future. And then you get this, what is what the hell is this Old West thing? I got to wait another summer for that to come out. So it was, <laughs> our house was buzzing Back to the Future sequels for like a good five years until we finally got to see them and experience them. And I don't think that they're anywhere close to the, 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 the lasting impact of the first one. But anything that I can take that is another adventure in the world of Back to the Future, I will gladly sign up for it. Yeah, it's interesting because you mentioned the to be continued and you mentioned the clip at the end. It's almost like a pre-Marvel before Marvel did it. Yeah. Back to the future did it, you know, so Marvel could fly, I guess, to quote a meme. Uh, <laughs> it's it's that idea of to be continued that now is so ingrained into our pop culture minds that we're so used to it that if I see a cut at the end of a movie – you know, my the first words that come out of my mouth are, oh, to be continued. Like, it's literally the phrase <laughs> that comes from Back to the Future. I mean, obviously, I'm not saying it's the first one that did it, but it almost made it iconic and so memorable. That That's really interesting. Absolutely. But but I, I love the sequels, uh, to be honest. And I think you're on the same page with me, RB3. Uh, shout out to Copster, too, Christian. Uh, I know he likes Back to the Future, too. Uh, and the sequels as well. So shout out to him. I know he's a big fan of Back to the Future. But RB3, what does the Back to the Future 2 mean to you? Um, yeah, Back to the Future Part 2. So I remember when I was a kid, like I would like I would love watching Back to the Future, but I would almost kind of like watching Back to the Future Part 2 even more, um, only because it was like, it was just so, it was so insane. Like they dealt with so many like different like plot lines. Like, like I said, the whole time traveling to the future, was just crazy. Um, the whole idea of like gambling and picking numbers. Um, now, to, now today, like, and as I got older and as I watched each movie like 200 times, I did kind of realize that, um, well, maybe like the second one's a little more fun and have a little more like kind of adventure to it. The first one is like more perfect and more of like a straight up like pitch perfect kind of like when it comes to like stri- script and texture and mythology and all that stuff. The first one was more perfect in that sense. The second one is not as perfect. It's definitely like, there's definitely flaws throughout. There's definitely like some logical gaps that they take that is a little like weird and and and, and, and interesting. But I definitely, um, I, I, I've always loved uh, Back to the Future Part 2. And then Back to the Future Part 3, um, that one doesn't get a lot of love either. I mean, that one probably gets the least amount of love, mostly because it's like a Western. Um, but I used to like Westerns growing up. So like, I kind of liked what they were going for there. I like the idea of like having these same characters kind of embody. I mean, it was like stuff like Biff's great grandfather and all that kind of stuff. And Biff's great grandfather is literally the exact, I think his name is Tiff, is literally the exact same way as Biff was like a like hundred years later or something like that. So it's like, it's funny that you get to see how these characters would interact with each other just like in, in the past. But for me, Back to the Future Part Two, I like, I love, like I mentioned before, I love the future stuff. I love the fact when they go back to 1985, they basically come back to Compton 
and like <laughs> the entire like literally all the houses have like bars on the have bars on the windows and then like um the principal of the school comes outside with a shotgun i just like <laughs> oh it's just so funny to see that so yeah i um yeah i love i love back to the future part two for sure yeah, absolutely. There's so many great moments. Uh, I know it's been a minute for you, Sabrina, but what is what is a good memory you have from the sequels? Um, I can't remember if it was the second or third. I think it was the second, but the shoes. The like, oh, yeah. Shoes. I, yeah, those shoes that was something so that cool. I remembered. I wanted, I wanted those when I was a kid. Um, and just as a whole, I do think this trilogy is a really good trilogy. I think it holds up. Um, I think a lot of the like critical reception maybe the more negative ones that they got like when it was actually coming out i think people have kind of softened up to it a little bit just because of the lasting impact it's had um because a lot of people are i feel like we're all like warming up to it a little bit more being less critical um but yeah i, I think it all holds up yes yeah, sabrina I, I remember like it's, sorry to cut you off i the, the power oh. waste is I remember we were walking out of the theater and we were like asking my mom how long before we could get power laces <laughs> or how long before we could get a hoverboard. Because back when that came out in 89, like y'all, you have no idea how far off in the future 2015 was in 1980. It was like, it was never gonna get here. It was it was never gonna arrive. And then it did, and we still didn't have hoverboards. And it's like, what the, this was what we were promised for, her. I've been waiting for, for 25 years. Come on, give me my hoverboard. Did yeah, you guys see that they, um, they made the shoes and gave them to Michael J. Fox? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that yeah. was, I love that. It was great. It was great. Uh, I mean, the the fact that we, remember the release of those shoes? I mean, RB3, you're a shoe guy, right? I mean, you remember when they released those? I think it was like three, four years ago. They had a huge party. Mm -hmm. I think Kid Cudi was there. Uh, and it was like 15 grand. I think that was like the starting price. And I was like, I don't have 15 grand. I, I want the shoes, but my God. Yeah. Um, and they didn't even do the actual power lace. Like that was the only thing that I was like kind of disappointed by. Like if you're going to charge that much, at least like automatically tie yourselves, like for sure. But then they, they didn't do that. So I was like, what's, what's the point of having the money other than like nostalgic purposes? Yeah. I mean, those shoes were iconic. I think his hat people, I think people actually have that hat. Like, they just give those out at Comic Con apparently because everyone has it. Uh, that hat is iconic. That jacket is wild. I would love to have that jacket. I think yeah. it's incredible. And, I, and the visual I, aesthetic is amazing. And I think out of any movie that like portrayed the future, especially during that time, I think out of any movie they they probably got the most right. Like granted, they uh, granted like it probably got the most wrong too. But I think out of like everything, it was like they took the most swings. And then I mean, just the idea of like having Skype, like they, they, they had like the video calling thing with the boss, um, but then they still used the fax machine, which was kind of funny. Um, I don't know if they, they realized that would go out of date, but then they, but then, you know, they had things like that, but then they had, um, they had the, the whole, the fashion sensibility, which I think is kind of, it's, it's, it's a little exaggerated, but I think people do kind of dress like that, like today, you know what I mean? Just are, are, are out there getting a little exaggerated. And not to mention, I mean, one of the biggest jokes in it is the Jaw 7 uh, advertisement that they have. Like, even though there's like no Jaw 7, they, they totally got the idea of like the 100 million franchises that are gonna come out. So I thought, I thought it's just funny seeing how much they got right, how much they got wrong, and like how accurately they ended up predicting 2015. Yeah, Andres, I also think Sabrina makes a great point as far as the critics softening up to it. I think that that, that that goes for general audiences too, simply because initially we were comparing two and three to the first one. And then when you sit back and you say, okay, well, maybe two and three aren't as great of a movie as the first one, but name other movies that are as fun as two and three, and you'd be hard pressed to do that too. So the time jumping in two is so much fun. The sports angle of two as a huge sports fan, Biff with the almanac and like any, anybody would kill for that almanac to go back to 1955 and make all those bets. It's just, it, it it's a movie that so, so many times sequels get accused of just like being a retread of the first one and back to the future two literally goes back for the second half of the movie. It's in the same exact set as the first one. And it never feels like it's retracing the same steps, even though that's exactly what it's doing. That that's the genius of that movie to me. Yeah. I mean, the fact that I love the sports angle, by the way, Mark, I'm also a sports guy. Uh, do you bet on sports by the way? Cause I feel like that's like the biggest sports betting movie besides uncut gems <laughs> you know it's like back to the future too and i feel like that's like a, a big thing that 
I know a lot of friends of mine that that bet on sports that that kind of go back to that movie. If if I was to bet on sports, I would have to go back in time, not because I would know the outcome, but just because I could bet on the sports team that I root for and they would actually win. Like, dude, I'm a Redskins fan. I'm an Orioles fan. We don't we don't win a lot of games, and I always bet with my heart over my head. So <laughs> I avoid gambling on sports like it's the play. Or maybe if you bet on it, it will actually happen. It's like that determinism thing that's on devs right now. Shout out to devs. What are you? Um, are you the devil on my shoulder right now? Just <laughs> 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 yeah, it's like maybe if you just make it happen, it will happen. Uh, but I feel like time travel is amped up to like a different degree in Back to the Future 2 with the whole idea of the butterfly effect. Uh, it, that's what I call it. Uh, but it's also the dark timeline thing where it's like one change you make in the past can make a different dark timeline, which has been, you know, made fun of and made in jokes and made in different movies uh, from superhero movies to like community has like a very funny episode on the dark timeline thing. Shout that, out to Community. That episode actually being directed by uh, the Russo brothers. There you go. If Marvel, Community, Russo, Back to the Future, it's all connected, guys. Uh, but yeah, what do you think about the time travel effects in Back to the Future 2, RB3? Um, I love it. I mean, that's, you know, like you said, it became so um, iconic. I mean, literally, um, we go back to Avengers Endgame. Avengers Endgame literally had that exact same breakdown, except with like Tilda Swinton from Doctor Strange, like giving that whole breakdown. This is what 1985 it looks like in this 1985A. And when you go to the dark the time- chalkboard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Add it, add it, and then they're literally like, um, and it's just crazy like going, seeing um, Biff in like this giant tower, like almost like a Trump, like like a Trump tower kind of thing. And then he has, uh, and then you see like Marty McFly's mom with like, these like giant like fake boobs and it's like yo what the heck like they <laughs> really mm -hmm. switch stuff up this is like you're, you're like no this is accurate <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> pretty spot on yeah, to our yeah current timeline no no it's crazy um and you know but yeah they th that ended up becoming a principle in sci-fi films even stuff like Looper um took that principle and, and, and ran with it a lot there's a lot of movies that take that kind of you change one thing the butterfly effect and then see how that goes and, and, and changes other. And then that's not to mention another big part of Back to the Future Part Two, like you mentioned, like you alluded to before, is the idea of like looking, like retreading the steps that you've seen in the previous movie. I mean, that's, again, I'm going back to Avengers Endgame. They had that whole, it was literally an entire hour of the movie where they were in other, the previous Marvel movies going back and, 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 and revisiting those moments and seeing them from a different angle and different perspective. And I've always loved when movies do that. That's, to me, that's like, really cool and really fun and, and like a really strange way. Yeah, it's interesting because it's almost like Back to the Future. W without Back to the Future, we wouldn't have something like a Marvel, something like the MCU, which happens to be the biggest franchise of all time. I mean, it, it's interesting because we keep going back to the whole idea of Back to the Future inspiring filmmakers, filmmakers like the Russos, directors of the biggest franchise of all time uh can do you see any other examples sabrina or any other uh directors or filmmakers or genres that seem to have that tone that comedy that science fiction blend of something like a back to the future a movie today we see um well when you guys were talking about the butterfly effect i thought about the movie the butterfly effect with ashton kutcher that came out before yeah i I love that movie and I love the way that portrayed time travel with that, like that whole kind of like alternate realities. You alter one thing, you change that. Cause that would be, that would be like something that would be realistic if we were to be time traveling. Maybe somebody is right now. We just don't know. Um, so the fact that they, that they, you know, they approach that subject in back to the future. I think that's something really important. So I love Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because that opens up a whole, different angle. RB3 knows that I'm a crazy, weird, science dimensional guy. Uh, but it, that immediately, I know that it's real. It's true, guys. Explain uh, further. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm, like. I'm like, huh? <laughs> well, I was going to say, do you guys actually believe that eventually we will solve time travel and there will be someone long down the road uh, who can solve that in real life? And I know that's a weird question to throw out, but I feel like it's a good question. Mark. I, this is why you need to text me, Mark. Take the edible at, at 5 p.m., not 8 p.m. So 
I'm a little unprepared to answer this question, but here's the thing that I will say about time travel. I, I don't know that we're ever going to get time travel in, in our lifetime, but the, the cool thing about it is that it could happen any minute. Why? Not because somebody right now is going to invent it. It's because somebody could come back from the time when it was invented and they could just arrive here and be like, oh, by the way, here's how you do it. And then, then we have it. And you know, hopefully they'll they'll wait a little bit until we have the proper leadership to take advantage of time travel. But I feel like I feel like the movie Time Cop showed us why we should never ever mess with time travel, and that we it would need to be like policed and regulated. And I I almost would rather have one crazy scientist like Doc Brown and nobody else know about time travel than have like everybody be aware that this is a thing going on. I I like to limit. Power like that to one crazy scientist who I trust, like Doc Brown. I mean, at this point, we should have done meeting of Time Cop, right? <laughs> that would be an interesting episode. Hey, we'll, we'll have you back on. <laughs> but it's that idea of like, obviously, I'll, I'll go a little dark for you guys real quick. If time travel does exist, who has access to the time travel? Will it be common folk like us or will it be the elite of the elite? Who have control of the bigger corporate supremacy? That never mind. I'm stopping, guys. It's over. <laughs> oh, yeah. Definitely, uh, it's over. definitely not Let's us. Go. Could you imagine if we had time travel just like at our like dispense? Like no way. Everything yeah. would be messed up. It's like the it's like the movie about time. If you guys have seen that one, mm. um, that's one that I absolutely love. But that one guy, the amount of changes, like changing one thing, the amount of lives it affects, like around him, just no. That would be absolutely pure insanity. Speaking of about time, do you guys have a favorite time travel movie that that your your favorite version of time travel or or uh, anything like that? Because I feel like every movie kind of has their own version, and I think Back to the Future kind of inspires that. Off the top of your head, do you guys have any? Um, for me, well, for me, my favorite non Back to the Future time travel movie movie is Looper. Um, however, like if you really think about Looper, it really doesn't make sense. And they even literally say it in the movie. Like if you think in the about trailer. it, too hard, yeah, in the trailer, they literally say, if you think about it too hard, it doesn't make sense. So like my favorite, the one version of time travel that's probably like the most realistic. I don't know if you guys heard that movie primer. Um, yes. I yeah, was gonna yeah. I was going to be the one that says it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that movie. I literally, like, to this day, can't still fully understand what that movie he's going for. Um, but that's probably the most realistic version of it, honestly. I don't know. Mark, you could probably speak more to that. But Well, yeah, I mean, when you, well, now, knowing what I know now, when you watch Primer, it's basically just watching Andres in his garage, like, just trying to come <laughs> up with different ways to discover <laughs> time travel. I mean, if, if I had to pick a favorite way to travel through time, the DeLorean's pretty awesome, but 88 miles an hour, I'm not sure I can always do that. So I might go Bill and Ted phone booth, but mm. there is a soft spot in my heart for the trailer for Time Cop because Time Cop, I, I think it's Van Damme's like best movie. I, I like Hard Target more, but I think the Time Cop's like his best movie. But the trailer, go back, everybody watch it. Go back and watch the trailer, the first trailer for Time Cop because it fools you into thinking it's some sort of celebration of Universal Pictures' history. And then all of a sudden, like, th there's this ripple and Jean Claude Van Damme walks through and you're like, what the fuck? What is happening? And then, <laughs> As a kid of a certain age, it's just like Van Damme was everything. And it's like, this is now the greatest. I'm so glad I paid money to go see Alec Baldwin in the shadow so that I could watch this trailer that ran before it. <laughs> Absolutely. Sabrina. Yeah, mine would definitely be about time. I love how like okay. they ground all of the like romance and the life and family drama stuff with all of that like science fiction elements. Huge fan of that. that. That's, that's the romantic one, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But it's like, it's more just about like life. Everyone thinks it's all romance. It's not. <laughs> Mark Mark had an incredible. Uh, man, I'm trying to point. Mark had an incredible uh, review for that back in the day. We had talked Did about it on, the on the reunion show uh, yeah. for this Mojo Note show. What was it? Um, I think yeah, scored it. Yeah, scored about time. What like about a, a four, like a four out of four out of five schmoes. Hey Molly. What? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Molly, Molly has to dominate the conversation again. <laughs> I, I gave about time like 3.8 out of five schmoes because I thought it was it was a great movie. My only gripe with about time is like I think whoever wrote it realized 
there's no cooler way to go back in time than a DeLorean. So they're just like, screw it, just do it in the closet. Who cares? I was I was just gonna say that I love that. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that he has to go in a closet and he like makes like a fist or something like that. Like I don't know, it always zooms in on his face. <laughs> it's but. so convenient. Just like like right, back to the future, you have to go get plutonium. You have to like find a road that'll get you up to eighty eight miles an hour. Yeah, about time, it's like yeah, I was just going in the closet. Yeah. Also, that's another thing I loved about Back to the Future Part Two is that like literally the first movie is all super complicated about the plutonium. You have these terrorists that are about to shoot Doc Brown over the plutonium, and literally the first scene in Part Two, yeah, it's just a garbage compactor. <laughs> <laughs> just kind of just remove the whole thing, you know? Yeah, like take the complications out of it. But <laughs> but it really is a fascinating thought of like. Back to the Future being that one movie that inspired so many different time travel movies. The one that I always say, and I said it like every podcast, it's your name. Uh, the anime film that that people talk about. Uh, it, I think that might be the most fascinating, grounded version of time travel I've ever seen. Uh, and that's saying a lot because it's more about traveling through your own consciousness uh, and, and traveling through an experienced timeline that you may have not experienced yet. It, it's really complex. Uh, again, this is what I study, guys. Uh, <laughs> it's what I do in my garage. Uh, <laughs> but it's really interesting and fascinating. And it's also like a sci-fi romance type movie. But without Back to the Future, I wouldn't have gotten that. So it's really interesting how that works. Uh, I before we go... I, yeah. I, I trust you with time travel. Like if <laughs> I, if it was in your hands, I just feel like if time travel gets invented, we have to make like a statement as a people and say, look, we have this technology. You're only allowed to use it to ensure that your mom and dad have sex at the exact same time that they did the first time. But if we're talking about back to the future, we're talking about time travel. I think we have to do this question just for everybody out there. If you could go back in time to any period in history, where are you going and what's a quick reason why? Mm, that's tough. I think about that a lot, man. Um, I'd probably want to go back to like the old like Egypt days or something like that. You know Ooh. what I mean? Like just to just to visit, see what's popping up there, see if those those pyramids were real or if the aliens dropped them down here. You know, you never know. <laughs> see, I'm going I'm going further back. I want to see if how, like I know this is a death sentence eventually. I want to see how long I survive in like the peak of the dinosaurs roaming the earth. I want to see, and yeah. I'm probably going to get killed by like a mosquito or something, but I want to see how long I can survive. If I'd be cool with a T-Rex, like would I be like Tiger King and would I just be able to go amongst these giant <laughs> wild animals and just like kind of be cool with all of them? I don't, I, I, I'm, I need to know that answer. That's great. Sabrina. Yeah. Um, I want to go like 1960s, 1970s New York, uh, Chelsea Hotel with just like all the poets and rock stars and everything and just kind of hang out with them. Yeah. I mean, part of me wants to go back uh, to a time that's more recent that has running water. I think that'd be great. Um, any, <laughs> any time that has, privilege. Yeah, I know. Anything that has toilets, I'm there. Uh, Bro, have you had the water? From the Mesozoic era, it is so <laughs> pure. And it's, it's, I will start to, to, to levitate. I'd slowly levitate. <laughs> you just see me ascending into heaven if I try that water. <laughs> uh, I'd probably go back to the Renaissance era. Take me to uh, take me to Renaissance Italy, where all the art was being made. I'd be a, a, a painter during that time, or, yeah, or an model. assistant painter. You'd be like uh, I, a Mona Lisa. Well, like current day we go, we just see like Andres. <laughs> well, he was in that time period. Yeah, I can pass as Mona Lisa. Yeah, totally. I love, I, mean, that, I, I love that Andres is the only one who's going to go back in time and actually get a job. He's like, no, I'll go back. <laughs> and I'll, I'll get a 401k, get a steady day job. And I'm like, I want to fight dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, put him up, dino. Uh, yeah, I, would, I, I, would, I would also go back. I'll probably go back to like, the the 80s or something when like not everybody in their mama was trying to be a filmmaker so it'd be a little easier like you know trying to try and make a movie or something back then like and then with some of the ideas and knowledge that you have now like it'd be like so groundbreaking they'd oh. be like oh i, I totally rip off the matrix like i totally rip that <laughs> off like they yeah. won't even see it coming <laughs>
What if we all go back in time to to hang out with Robert in the early <laughs> 80s and we see a billboard for Robert Butler presents Titanic and we're like, dude. Yeah. You told yeah, me. <laughs> yeah, he loves James Cameron, so he can do that. You, you would do that, RB3. I, I think RB3 put, makes a good point. If I, if I could be the first something to do something, yep. uh, the, the first Latino on the moon – uh, and I can inspire other Latinos and then we take over the world by the time it's like 2020. Uh, and then everyone can, you know, finally get used to us because we're here. Uh, I, I think that'd be fun if I could be like the first Latino to like make this medicine and I just copy the formula and just do that. Uh, I think that'd be really interesting. Yeah, time, sure. time, time travel back to 2019 and Warn everybody about Corona and uh, <laughs> try and get this thing. Get, try and get this thing. I over mean, with, Trump would know. ignore it though. So just go go back in time, <laughs> take that bat out of the soup, and we're all good. <laughs> one simple move. I don't, I don't know though. Will it be? <laughs> uh, either way, guys, I want to end really quick on your favorite sequel moment. Uh, it could be part three. I think part three has a really fun scene. Um, or part two, either way. I'll start with you, Mark. Any favorite moment or scene or line from the sequels? I, I do. I, I think three holds up really well. And and it, it is such a great just Western adventure with a lot of great comedic moments in it. And I love seeing Marty McFly and Seamus McFly, both played by Michael J. Fox. It's, it's really fun what they were able to do. And I think that where Back to the Future 2 falls short is not having Crispin Glover actually come back to reprise this role as George McFly because of a contract negotiation dispute. But instead of that, we get more Thomas F. Wilson. We get old Biff and then we get back to 1985 Biff. And my favorite scene that just makes me laugh endlessly is when old Biff goes back to 1955 and he's sitting in Biff's car and Biff walks back over to the car and he sees this old guy sitting in the car. He's like, get the hell out of my car, old man. <laughs> the way he delivers it is so perfect. It's why Thomas F. Wilson is so underrated as an actor. He's, he's so funny. Just it, It's a note-perfect delivery. Make, I, make like a tree and get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like every line delivery he has, Mark, is like really well done and well said. Every time he says, my car, it's hysterical. So. Yeah. That's a great one, uh, RB three. Um, yeah, that I mean, that's that that was one of the moments I, I was going to mention too, like him, him giving them the actual uh, book. Um, uh, and, and Back to the Future Part Two, uh, Back to the Future Part Three has like a lot of great scenes that I love too. Um, I love every time. I love how they completely made up the whole Marty McFly like yellow belly thing, or, or, or like, are you yellow? Are you chicken? You chicken, huh? Like they totally made that up for the sequels, but I kind of love that they did that because it kind of gives it like a, a through line. Um, I love when it happens in part three when they're like in the old Western thing and he uh, and he has the, uh, and they're they're about to have like that shootout in the um, in the saloon or whatever. And um, you see Doc Brown has like the bulletproof vest on like uh, under the entire time. Um, and then um, I also love part three when like at the ending sequence when, the, when it's like the train, they, instead of having a DeLorean, they have to use a train because it was like 1885. So <laughs> they had to push the DeLorean on a train at 88 miles an hour. So just kept feeding it cold and cold so it, get, it gets there fast enough. Um, yeah, I, 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 I love those moments for sure. Yeah, mine was, you took mine with Doc Brown in the Bulletproof. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's so good. Yeah, I mean, the Mexican standoff scene is, is pretty great. Uh, anytime you have like a Western and a Mexican standoff, I think it's pretty amazing. I, I recently saw the Coen Brothers movie. Uh, what's it called? Uh, the one that you recommended, RB3. True Grit? No, the, the one with uh, the comedy one on Netflix. Oh, uh, The Ballad of Buster Scruggs. There you go. There you go. And, and I think I actually really enjoy that song. It was an Oscar nominated song. Yeah. Uh, but anytime you have a Mexican standoff, being a Mexican, I approve. Uh, <laughs> I, I like it quite a bit. So that, that's probably my favorite moment as well. But either way, Mark, thank you so much for doing this, man. This was so much fun. Uh, you brought your own flavor, your own thoughts. And, and I loved every second of it. Thank you so much for doing this, man. Hey, it's it's a pleasure to be on with y'all. As you all know, I'm a fan of each and every one of you, and the show is great. And I'm just it's it's an honor to be involved. And the last thing I'll say is that we should all aspire to one day be as cool 
as George McFly at the end of Back to the Future when he comes in from playing tennis and he's just the coolest guy in the room. And you're like, what the hell happened to this guy? It's one of my favorite sneaky good moments in Back to the Future. Absolutely. Uh, Mark, where can the good people find you? Um, you can find me chilling, playing Wii Golf instead of doing stand-up most nights. But if you want to revisit some of my stand-up, then you can check out Dog Stepfather on YouTube right now. Thank you, by the way, to Robert for being a great, um, not only producer on that uh, this is special, but also you can hear his laugh in a couple moments, and it really helps pick the energy of the room out. So I, <laughs> I owe you big for that one, bud. And on social media, it's just at Mark Ellis Live. And um, you can also find me trying to get back uh -oh. in the chair. There you go. <laughs> Look up, Molly. Molly. Up. No, that's, her, that's her chair now. She's, yeah. uh, she's not talking to me because I didn't I didn't feed her. I, I didn't I didn't take a break from this show to feed her again. So she's she's yeah. not happy. <laughs> now now's the time. Now's the time, Molly. <laughs> Don't worry, it's gonna be soon. But either way, guys, thank you so much for listening. Obviously, I'm at Squad Leader Ace. I'm at Director RB3. At Sabrina X Monica. And you can find us at First Cut TMO. And obviously subscribe to the First Cut YouTube channel. That's where you can find our good content right here. We did our live stream last week, so make sure you guys keep supporting us. We appreciate each and every one of you. Your support is amazing. Uh, and yeah, for the Meaning of Podcast, I am Andres. This is RB3. And I'm Sabrina. I'm Mark, and I need a haircut. Hey, <laughs> and we're peacing out, guys. Peace out. <laughs>